Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest webinar from the CQI um, delivered in partnership with QMT. Um, delighted to have you guys back uh, for another session with us. Um, today, we're going to be looking at statistical process control, SPC. Um, throughout the webinar, uh, if you have any questions, then please submit them in the question function uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll endeavour to pose those questions to Jeff and John uh, at the end of the session. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded throughout uh, and put in the members area of the CQI website. So you're able to go back, revisit the webinar, um, should you so wish, um, and also share it with colleagues and friends who may be members of the CQI. Uh, the slides, along with any other documents mentioned, will be accessed, uh, can be accessed via the handout function, also on your control panel. Uh, and finally, a reminder that after this webinar, to reflect on what you've learnt, um, to reflect on the questions that you've asked, um, and to make sure that you complete uh, your CPD log recording this activity um, as, as contributing to your professional development. Um, that's quite enough from me. Um, I'm delighted to hand over to John Dedman and Jeff Forley from Quality Management and Training Limited for today's session on statistical process control. Over to you. Thank you, Alex. That's uh, very nice of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll um, I'll uh, take over for a few minutes, and then John will do the full uh, presentation slideshow. So uh, next slide, please, John. So Q QMT Quality Management Training again since '84. I think one or two of you may have heard of us. Um, we provide uh, support for uh, quality, health and safety, environmental, security support, and also provide training as well. Um, a lot of uh, CQI ERCA qualification training as well we provide as distance learning. Next slide, please, John. So this is John, uh, uh, MSc in Quality Management Statistics, Fellow of the uh, CQI, member of the uh, American Society for Quality, uh, certified quality engineer and certified uh, black belt as well so be careful of him because uh, he has got a black belt. Um, wrote quality, uh, quality management Six Sigma with some other gentleman called Jeff Forley whoever he is uh, and he delivers training consultancy. Okay next slide please uh, please John. This is this is me so I'm CEO of quality management and training limited uh, quality manager for one or two companies uh, associate lecturer at Surrey University and uh, written a few books as well, including uh, the book uh, with John on Six Sigma. Next slide, please, John. So this course is based to a degree on CQI ERCA's certified training courses, uh, PT 208 specifically. And if you follow that link, I think the link will uh, survive in the uh, in the PDF version. If you want to find out more information about um, uh, this certified training, then you can either go to our website at uh, qmt.co.uk or you can go to Urca's website, uh, CQI's website, and find information there. And there are other training courses as well associated with uh, uh, SBC and the like. That's enough from me, I think. John, uh, I think I'd like you to take away if that's okay with you. Okay, thank you, Jeff and Alex, and welcome everyone to this webinar. So, the topics that we're planning to look at in this session are as follows, understanding process variation, principles and purpose of SPC, the use of SPC control charts, which is one of the main sets of tools that are used, and also to look at another key element of SPC, which is process capability and performance, but furthermore, process improvement. First of all, Let's understand what is meant by SPC or statistical process control. How can we describe it briefly? It's a set of principles, tools and techniques used for process qualification. In other words, when we're introducing a new process, we want to check that it's working correctly. Ongoing process monitoring, problem solving and continual improvement. It's applicable to a wide range of process situations, uh, wherever we can collect data to understand and manage the performance of both manufacturing and non-manufacturing processes. Although its origins were in the manufacturing sector, um, there are many types of non-manufacturing processes that are suitable for SPC. 
Um, and it's one of the, the major core tools. Okay, so let's begin by looking at control charts. Um, and this takes us back to the origins of SPC. And today, um, I, I will mention that SPC is not new. It was first introduced in the 1920s, the 1930s. Um, so we're, really, it's been around for over 90 years. Um, things have moved on since then. Technology's moved on, and SPC has been expanded. Um, there are many more types of charts and other methods available today. But it is very important to understand the basic principles because th those are still the foundation of modern SPC. So th the, the aim of this seminar is that we get we look at the key principles and intent of SPC. There's there's no plan to get involved with complicated statistics or formula. Um, the computers and software and calculators can do that for us today, but it is really important not to lose sight of these basic principles um, if we're to use modern technology effectively. So um, I'd like to go back to the 1920s and 1930s for a moment. The control chart, the SPC methodology, was introduced by Dr. W. Shewart, pronounced Shewhart or Shewart. Um, he contributed a number of things to, to quality management. He was also a significant inspiration to Dr. W. Edwards Demin when they were colleagues at the Western Electric Company in America. And Western Electric itself is a significant organization in the context of SPC because Western Electric developed Schuert's work. Um, they took it forward, they expanded it, um, and that's led to further developments which we, we, we still use or we're still um, able to utilize today. The Schuert's task at Western Electric was to improve their processes. That was the main focus of his attention, process improvement. And during his process studies, he recognized the following key points. All types of processes have a natural spread or inherent variability due to factors associated with the design and method of operation of the process. Schuert referred to this as the system. Typically, however, process performance over a period of time was adversely affected by additional factors that were not part of the process design or intent. The efforts of process personnel to achieve the desired process outputs were hampered by a lack of understanding of the behaviour of their processes. So Schuert recognised these key points at an early stage, and then he, he, he develop the SPC methodology um, to, to, to be able to manage and tackle these problems. One of the things that Schuert became aware of um, very quickly as part of his studies was that process variation was not fully understood and two inadvertent types of misjudgment occurred um, when process personnel uh, were unable to correctly interpret process performance. Um, these are these are very important things to be aware of in the context of SPC, that this is really the foundation of, of what it is about. Schuert noticed, first of all, that one type of misjudgment or one type of error was over adjustment. This is where adjustments to a process were implemented by process personnel in the belief that the process behavior had changed when really it had not. In other words, they obtained a, a result, perhaps from a measurement um, or some process output that seemed a little bit unusual, and that prompted them to try to compensate from that. However, in many cases, this was an unnecessary and inappropriate action. And unfortunately, it actually increased the variation of the process. So it had the opposite effect to that which was intended. The opposite type of misjudgment or error also occurred under adjustment. Adjustments to a process were not implemented when the process behavior had in fact changed. The need for intervention was not recognized. The process personnel didn't realize their process had changed and that they needed to take some action. Hence, the action was not taken. Schuert wanted to find a solution to these issues. 
and this led to the introduction of the control chart methodology. Okay. Let's have a look now at the principle of a control chart. One of the key principles in SPC is to plot the data, to give it visibility on some sort of chart or graph. It's much easier to understand a data set um, when we present it in a visual format rather than to interpret numbers, often large quantities of numbers. Data collected from the process is plotted in some rational sequence, which very often is based on time or order of production. That was another key point that Schuett recognised. The actual order of process production was, was an important part of the SPC methodology. And that was the, the, the data points when there, as you can see, we have red data points plotted on the graph. They were linked together with line segments to assist with the interpretation. And the chart that we're looking at captures the variation of the process. We can see that the data points waver up and down. However, it's not always clear whether the process performance changes within the time frame that we're looking at at the moment, for example. So that prompted Stuart to study in more detail variation. And he realized that variation occurs in all processes due to causal factors. Schuett defined two types of causes of variation. So now we have another really key principle of SPC. First of all, Schuett introduced the term unassignable causes, which is a, a rather awkward term to use sometimes, and it is more commonly known as common causes. He also introduced the term assignable causes, which later became referred to as special causes. So again, these are a really key part of the SPC methodology. Let's have a look at these causes in a bit more detail. Common causes. These are random. Stuart referred to them as chance causes, which are a normal feature of a process. They're the routine variation. And it's always present. And because it's always active, it causes variation in all of the process output all of the time. Now that's not a good thing, but one thing that is good about it is that it is at least predictable once we understand it, because it's stable and it's always there. Common causes comprise a group of factors which are mostly small and uncontrollable, and it could be a very large group in fact. Consequently, it's difficult, um, in fact it's often impossible, to identify all of the individual factors within this group. And this is reflected by Schuett's term, unassignable causes. Um, he felt that it would be difficult and not worthwhile to try to individually identify them and tackle them. And most of them were very small anyway. It was the fact that they acted as a, as a group of critical mass that introduced variation into every process. So the summary is that common causes are an inherent natural part of a process. Let, let's have a look at a few examples of things that could be common causes. Process personnel. People may be trained and competent for their work task. However, inevitably, there will be differences in the way that people carry out a work task based on their levels of skill and knowledge and technique, etc. They probably all achieve the required results, but they're likely to do it in slightly different ways. Traffic conditions. This would be relevant to traveling or delivery processes. Temperature, which affects the work environment or the equipment. Demand on the computer system. Sometimes it responds quickly, other times it's rather slower. And variation used in materials, um, in materials used by the process. The same material will vary, different batches, different suppliers. So the above are examples of the inevitable variation that exists under normal process conditions. An important summary of common causes, and again, this is something that Schuert determined, when there are only common causes present, a process will be operating as consistently and predictably as possible under the current conditions, under the current design of that process. And Schuert described such a process as operating in statistical control. Often that's referred to simply as being stable. As we've already noted, any adjustment to a stable process to compensate for a perceived unusual value will actually increase the variation. 
over adjustment. So common cause is linked directly to over adjustment. The special causes, however, are rather different. And, and this was a key um, element that Stuart focused on. A special cause is a dominant individual source of variation, which is not part of the routine process variation. It's not inherent in the system or design of the process. Typically, a special cause is sporadic. It happens occasionally. It's not always active. And very often, it's unpredictable. When it's active, a special cause will change the behavior of the process in a noticeable way. If it didn't, we wouldn't be concerned about it. In the presence of a special cause, a process is often described as out of control or unstable, and it has become unpredictable. Examples of special causes. A special cause could relate to a specific problem, such as something that causes the IT system to fail. It could be a dominant process variable, which is not adequately controlled. Um, a key equipment setting, for example, which can change perhaps by itself, or maybe it can be changed when really it shouldn't be. A special cause could be a common cause, which has become extreme. For example, in a traveling or delivery process, unusually bad traffic conditions could affect the process delivery times. Demin actually introduced the term special causes, and he also makes the comment that this is one of the great contributions that Dr. Stewart gave the world. So this is a very key part of the SPC methodology. So let's now revisit control charts um, and see how the control chart developed based on these key principles that Stewart had established. The difficulty now was to determine the state of control of the process. Is it stable? Are there any special causes active? A control chart always captures common cause variation because it's always active. However, it's not often not clear whether any special causes are also active as their effects will be merged with the common causes. So when we look at this chart that's on the screen at the moment, it raises the question, does this chart show only common causes? Are there any special causes active? Very importantly, has the process behavior changed? Is any intervention or adjustment required? There are at least a few points, um, and I've circled them, as you can see, where it might raise the question, um, has the process changed? We've got a couple of observations which appear to be rather smaller than the others and we have another observation which appears to be a bit larger are, are they exceptional or are they just part of the inherent process variation it's not always clear so Stuart had to find a way of distinguishing special cause variation from common cause variation to do this he introduced control limits he used statistical methods to estimate the variation of the process. This was achieved by collecting data from the process during a suitable period of process operation. And he calculated a statistic called the standard deviation. Standard deviation is a measure of spread or scatter. And the units of measurement are the same as those used for the process characteristic. So if we're um, measuring something in terms of time, maybe hours or days or even weeks, then those same units apply to the standard deviation of that process. A couple of simple examples. On the left of the screen, we can see an example of a small standard deviation. The graph on the right shows a larger standard deviation, and, that, and that's fairly clear. The symbol that is often used represent standard deviation within formula and calculations is the Greek character sigma. And SPC practitioners will often use the term sigma rather than refer to standard deviation. So it's a statement of spread or variation. The need to distinguish between the common causes and the special causes is directly associated with the two types of misjudgment that we've already looked at. Over, over adjustment 
and under adjustment. So we're kind of um, pulling some of these principles together now and seeing how they're addressed by the control limits. Unfortunately, any actions to reduce the probability of over adjustment will inevitably increase the probability of under adjustment. So in fact, there is no perfect solution. Um, that works both ways, in fact. Therefore, a suitable balance was required to minimise both issues. Newark was aware that for any process, most of the common cause variation will be captured within a spread of several standard deviations. On this basis, he adopted an empirical approach, a practical approach. He, he carried out trials and he found that setting the control limits apart at a distance of six standard deviations provided a very reasonable and economical balance. Um, he was very um, focused on achieving something that would work in practice and it would work for his organization, Western Electric. So he often uses the term economical. And as he said himself, that worked in practice. So there was some element of statistical um, theory behind the control limits, but there was an even bigger um, practical element. As the control limits are usually set equally around the center line of a control chart, these limits are often referred to as plus or minus three sigma limits, or very simply three sigma limits. So let's revisit the graph that we looked at earlier. Now we can see that a center line has been added and we now have control limits. We have an upper control limit uh, located at three standard deviations above the center and we have a lower control limit located at three standard deviations below the center line. The purpose of the control limits is to filter out the common cause variation and to signal the presence of any special causes. However, in the chart above, there is no evidence of a special cause. All of the data points are randomly scattered within the control limits. So in fact, there are no special causes signaled. There are no points beyond the control limits. However, let's have a look at a different chart. So now we're going to see how a special cause would be signaled. Let's imagine that we're the process personnel um, plotting data for our process on this chart. So far, we've plotted data up to sample seven or subgroup seven. The data points would be at some suitable frequency. It could be daily, by shift, by week, monthly. It really depends on the process. Now we plot the next data point and we link it up with a line segment and another subgroup nine and now subgroup 10. No, nothing unusual happening. We can see variability, which is almost certainly due only to common causes. But now at subgroup 11, we've got an unusual value. We have a point that's plotted above the upper control limit. It's very unlikely that that would happen by chance. In fact, it is much more likely that the process behavior has changed due to a special cause. So we have an unusual observation. We have exceptional variation signaled. It's important to investigate any control chart signals promptly while the relevant process conditions exist before the trail goes cold. The purpose of the control chart is to distinguish between common and special causes of variation. That is a key point. Um, that is its job. And this is how it, one of the methods or the first method um, that was used to achieve that. Let's have a look now at the application of control charts. SPC methods tend to be applied to important characteristics of a process or the process outputs. These days, a variety of types of charts are available to suit different applications. The SPC has developed since Schuert's original control charts. There are now charts for continuous data. That means measurements, where we get a measured value, um, usually obtained by using some sort of measuring device. It might be time being measured in minutes or hours or days. 
There are also charts for discrete data. And this is very simply counted and it's plotted either as a number or it may be plotted as a proportion or a percentage. And this is very useful data, particularly for non-manufacturing processes where there may be fewer measurements available, but the, where we still need, where we still have important characteristics that we need to, to, to monitor and maybe improve. Some possible applications of control charts, a measured product dimension, a key process or equipment parameter, the number of errors in financial documents, the delivery performance, perhaps for a courier firm, customer complaints, maybe on a monthly basis, perhaps, the cost of errors, of scrap or rework, probably something that we want to try to reduce. N the number of health and safety incidents. This is not just about manufacturing or other business processes. There are other types of process that we can chart with SPC. The results of visual checks or gauging systems where we have a pass fail decision. The time to process service transactions. Downtime for equipment or the IT system. Results of product testing. So the application of SPC is really limited to one's imagination. Um, it has a wide scope of application. As long as we can collect data of some sort, which is often possible, then we can put that onto a control chart and understand the process behavior. However, I'd like to move on now to a rather different element of SPC and another very important one, process capability. Um, now, so far in this webinar, we have not discussed a tolerance or a specification. Because as we've seen, a control chart is based on the inherent variability of the process itself. There doesn't need to be a tolerance or a specification defined. And for some processes, there won't be one. Um, but in the manufacturing context, it's quite likely that there will be a manufacturing drawing or specification which has a tolerance. So it is important that we achieve that as well as having a process which is in control. Um, and I'd like to explain in a bit more detail the difference between control limits versus the tolerance. Um, this is yet another very key principle of SPC. I'm going to refer in a moment, the slide, slide's blank at the moment, but I'm going to refer in a moment again to the Western Electric Company. During the 1950s, Western Electric wanted to capture their organisational knowledge and make sure that it could be utilised within their organisation. They developed Schuett's work even further, so things had been moved on in the 1950s. Western Electric produced what is probably one of the classic reference documents for SPC, often known as the Western Electric Handbook. And this captured their knowledge, for not just for SPC, but for the use of statistical methods in general. And it was published within Western Electric and it was utilised by their personnel. The quote that, I've that I'm showing on the slide now is a very important one to note. Western Electric tell us, do not confuse the control limits on the control chart with the specified blueprint limits, which are commonly found on the drawing. The control limits are natural process limits determined by calculation from the nature of the process itself. The limits on a drawing are artificial selected limits. They may or may not have any reasonable connection with the natural limits of the process. So that's a particularly important thing to be aware of um, when we use SPC and that situation has, has not changed. There are a wider variety of charts available these days, so we may very well be studying the tolerance in particular situations, but a control chart is based on the inherent process variation. So um, let's actually focus now on the tolerance or specification, process capability. This is a very key thing to um, achieve. Capability is the ability of a process to produce items which meet the relevant tolerance or specification. As we've noted, its capability is very different from process control, which is concerned with the stability of the process. I'd like now to try to illustrate um, the difference between 
control and capability. Let's consider a travelling process. I'm sure that we can all relate to this type of process. A person travelling routinely to work. We can see on the screen a control chart for the journey times during a sample month for this tra person's travelling process. Each data point is one journey. In a statistical context, this process is stable or in control. There are no data points beyond the control limits. There are no special causes of variation signalled. However, this might not be an acceptable process. It's possible that the traveller frequently arrives late for work, even though their travelling process is stable. But we've got no visibility of that on this chart because the control limits are not the specification. Um, we would need to carry out a capability study to determine whether the process is meeting that standard or requirement of the person arriving on time. When the process output is compared to a specification or tolerance, this is referred to as capability. However, there is a little bit more to be aware of. Let's have a look at a different travelling process for a different person. We have another control chart, but we recognise now that in a statistical context, this process is unstable. It's out of control. There are one or more data points beyond a control limit. So this is a process which is not operating consistently. However, it might be acceptable in respect of the specification. It's possible that the traveller always arrives on time for work, even though their travelling process is unstable. It may be the case that they allow sufficient time for travelling such that they will arrive on time despite these, um, these unpredictable and unstable conditions. Now, that's not a good situation, um, but th this really highlights the difference between control and capability. Um, and I'd like to develop that even further on the next slide, because there are, in fact, four combinations of control and capability. You might like to consider the two graphs, the two charts that we've just looked at. The first chart that we looked at was in control, but not capable. The journey times were stable, but the traveller sometimes arrived late. The second chart that we've just looked at the process is out of control, but it is capable. The journey times are unstable, but the traveller always arrives on time. A third possibility is that the process is both out of control and not capable. The journey times are unstable and the traveller sometimes arrives late. That's probably the worst case scenario. But what we really want to achieve using SPC methods is the best of both. We want a process that's in control and is capable. We want the journey times to be stable and the traveller always arriving on time. So that is the, the, the goal of SPC. But the two things operate independently of each other. So we can't make the statement that if a process is in control, it's also capable. Um, hopefully that's true, but it might not be. How do we describe capability? Well, back to statistics again, the variation and setting of a stable process are compared with the specification or the tolerance, and the result is described by a capability index. There, there are various types. Some commonly used indices are the CP and CPK. The acceptance criteria are usually defined by the organization or very often by customers. Um, a general requirement is that the process variation and setting are well within the specification and not just about achieving the requirements. There needs to be allowance for shift and drift within the process. The capability results to be reliable and predictable. A prerequisite is that the process is in control, that it's stable. If a process is out of control, then any capability studies we carried out um, will provide results which will change as the process itself changes. So for capability studies to be meaningful and useful and predictable, 
it's essential that the process is stable. And how do we know that? We should have a control chart available so that we know that it is stable. Let's have a look at a couple of simple examples of capability. And I, I, I've kept this as simple as possible. Um, we have two specification limits. Now, these are not control limits. This is a, this is a tolerance of a drawing or a specification. The lower limit, the upper limit. Data from the process have been plotted, in this case, in the form of a histogram. And we can see that we have poor capability. The process variation exceeds the specification. This would normally be determined by using the standard deviation and a fairly simple formula. Basically, we divide the width of the histogram into the distance between the specification limits. It's a simple ratio. Um, the, if we did that mathematically, we would end up with a process capability index, which is less than one because the, the, the process variation is greater than the quantity that we're dividing it into. The other thing that we notice here is that the process is not very well centered. Um, the middle of the process or its setting um, is towards the upper spec limit. So this is not generally not considered acceptable. However, uh, a rather better process, um, probably a very good process is visible now. Good capability, the process variation is well within the specification. The process is well centered. It's located in the middle of the specification limits. Um, we're not particularly close to either specification limit. There is room for the process variation to move around a little bit, to shift and drift. The capability index is approximately two. Um, the width of the histogram would fit approximately twice into the distance between the upper and lower step limits. Okay. We now move on to the next step in SPC, which is process improvement. Continual improvement is generally expected these days. Um, many quality management standards require continual improvement. Process improvement often focuses on reducing variation and waste in a stable process when special causes have been addressed. If we try to introduce improvements into an unstable process, the efforts will be hampered by the special causes. However, the approach to process improvement requires a different type of action to that used to establish statistical control. Action to stabilize an out of control process Focus on, focuses on special causes of variation as signaled on the control chart. That's what we've already been looking at. When a process is stable, when we've achieved that condition, we also know that any adjustment to a process will increase the variation. Hence, it's better not to adjust the process. Otherwise, that would be over adjustment. What we really need is improvement in this situation as distinct from adjustment. To improve a stable process requires that the action is directed at the dominant common causes. This is gonna focus attention on the design of the process, the method of operation that might need to be improved or, or changed, done differently. Variation in the process inputs might need to be reduced. Now we, now we um, look at another key tool that, or principle that Schuert contributed to quality management. He introduced the original concept of the plan, do, check, act cycle. And this is a very simple model for continual improvement. And it, and it goes well beyond quality. This is used in, in many areas of, of business. W. Edwards Demin referred to PDCA as the Schuert cycle because he took it on board and promoted its use. However, it quickly became known as the Deming cycle. Later, Deming renamed it to Plan, Do, Study, Act. And this is something else which is very relevant today. Um, and if we have a look very briefly at the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle, 
the first step is planning. We select an opportunity for improvement. We understand the current situation. Um, we develop solutions. Then we move on to the next step, do. We implement our solutions, our plans. And then we move on to the check-in step, step. We monitor the results against our plans. We determine the reasons for any deviations. And that takes us to the fourth step, act. Corrective action is implemented for any deviations. And when we're happy that we've achieved uh, a, a good result, we standardize the process to, to make the, the successful solutions permanent. We capture the lessons learned, and then we go round again as a continuous improvement cycle. So to summarize, the benefits of SPC, it assists an organization to qualify, monitor, and improve processes. It enables process personnel and process owners to better understand the behavior of their processes without having to rely on judgment. It helps to achieve better consistency in process outputs, reduced variation. Within SPC, conformance to requirements is often considered insufficient. Customers tend to interpret quality in terms of variation as well as specifications. It helps to improve the predictability of process performance, which is another key word which is often used within SPC. So um, to summarize what we've covered within this webinar, we've looked at process variation. We've looked at some of the really key principles and purpose of SPC. These are equally important today, even when we use software and other methods. We shouldn't lose sight of these key foundation principles. We've looked at the use of SPC control charts. We've looked at process capability and performance, and we recognize that there is a distinction between the two, but both of them are important. And we've looked at process improvement. So that brings us to the end of the presentation slide. So I hope that's been useful to, to everyone. Um, in a moment, we will be tackling, I hope, some questions. Um, however, just before we do that, I'd like to hand back to Jeff, who I think would like to say a few words. Thank you, John. That was first class. Thank you. Well done. Um, I now understand SPC a lot better than I did before, that's for sure. Um, just to say um, that the webinar was based on, as I said earlier, the CQI Certified Training Courses PT 208, which has got an element of uh, statistical process control in it. There are other uh, training courses available for uh, this uh, 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 this statistical methods uh, available to you as well and you'll find those in the slides and if you want to find any further information please go ahead and visit either CQI or, or QMT and uh, there's a, an email address there as well. So uh, thank you for that. John would you like to pop back to the previous slide for me and uh, I think Alex is going to join us to, uh, to organise um, and facilitate the questions. Hi, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, just first, a quick note um, to say how great it is to see so many members joining us today, particularly given uh, the global distribution of our members. We've got people from America, people from the yeah. Middle East, and um, people from all over the world joining us. So we're really grateful to you for taking the time. Um, and I'm sure you'd all like to thank me in, uh, join me in thanking John uh, and, and Jeff for what has been a very interesting uh, view of um, you know, a, a key quality tool. Um, so thank you both for that. Uh, we have had some questions come in. Um, we'll try and get through as many as we can, um, but if not, we'll try and address them in writing after the webinar. Um, so if you have a burning question, then please do um, feel free to send it in. Um, just to touch on a couple of things that we discussed at the end of uh, your presentation, John. Um, we've talked um, about CP and CPK. Um, mm -hmm. Could you describe a little bit more um, for me? Um, you know what what we're describing in in terms of process capability, the difference between CP and CPK. Okay, CP index is a very simple ratio. We find the difference between the upper spec limit and the lower spec limit, and we divide that typically by six standard deviations of the process variation. So that tells us whether the process variation will fit 
within the specification. The CPK, however, is extremely important because it adds an additional view or it adds a different view of the process. It tells us where the process is actually set. It is possible that the process variation would fit between the specification, but if the process is not properly targeted, um, we could still have um, process outputs that are outside of the proce process specification. So it's about the centering of the process. Um, the basic condition is that we want the process to be centered approximately in the middle of the specifications. Sometimes there are reasons for deviating from that, but that is a standard practice. Um, it's also important to recognize that the estimate of standard deviation is based on a within subgroup estimate of the process variation. Um, and that's based on uh, the variation that occurs within a very small period of process operation. Um, it would not be correct to um, obtain that estimate using um, a global estimate of process variation um, because um, the, the basis of the uh, CP and CPK are that they predict the very best that we can achieve if we have an in-control process. Um, so that, is a, that brings us back to emphasizing again the importance of control. Now, if we have a process which is not stable, that it's unpredictable, it's got special causes of variation, then we would use a different set of indices to understand that condition, which would be the PP and the PPK. And these are rather different. The, 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 the principles and calculations are quite similar, but the estimate of standard deviation is the global estimate of all of the data pulled together as one big group. So that, that ignores subgrouping, um, it ignores whether the process is in control or not, it captures all of the variation. But the, we want to achieve a process that is stable and capable. So we want to focus on getting the CP and the CPK right. So John, there's um, some stand, uh, there's some standard formula for CP and CPK? Yeah, yes, um, the, 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 the formula, um, they're, they're very simple. Um, CP is upper spec limit minus lower spec limit divided by six sigma. Um, for the CPK, um, the setting of the process or centering, there are two formula used and we simply measure the center of the process from each specification limit and the worst case scenario which would be the lower value um, is taken to be the CPK. Um, so and the, so CP is the measure of capability and CPK is a measure of capability plus centricity, centrality as well, correct, centricity correct. as well. Thank correct. CP tells us whether the process variation would fit within the specification and CPK tells us where it is actually located. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, building on that further, um, can we uh, talk a little bit more about the difference between um, adjustment and improvement of, of processes? Yeah, um, Schuert's view was that special causes were things that were the immediate target for SPC. That was the main focus of his attention initially. The special causes are outside of the, the, the design of the process. So that was his first target. Um, and those are things that require action, they require adjustment, they require intervention. When, when we have achieved a stable process, Schuert's view then was that we needed to tackle um, on a bigger scale the system itself. Um, so now he started to focus on the design of the process itself. And that was a different type of action. We might have to change the process, we might have to change the method. He saw that as being distinct from adjustment. Adjustments were things that process personnel should be aware of and should be able to do, um, ideally themselves or perhaps with support from others. But process improvement is fundamentally changing the design of the process. So there is would it be, sure, would it be fair to say, sorry, John, sorry. Would it be fair to say, John, that uh, uh, a special causes of variation can generally be uh, managed by people close to the process, whereas common causes of variation, generally speaking, requires management action to improve the process. Is that um, fair? 
it, it is fair. Um, that was Schuert's view and it was Deming's view as well. There, there, there was some um, qualification to that where it was recognised that sometimes special cause variation would need the support of management or engineers or supervisors. Um, but the, the basic principle is exactly as you've just stated. So get rid of common co uh, uh, special causes first and then tackle common causes next Definitely. second. Definitely, um, and it's important to do it in that sequence. Alex. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, this is a, a question that perhaps we were expecting to come up uh, as a result of this, this webinar. Um, I think uh, traditionally SPC is um, predominantly seen applied in, in manufacturing and industrial scenarios. Where does it fit into service provision? And, and any, any data that we can collect from a service operation we should be able to put on the control chart. It's got a very, if we can collect measured data, which might very well be time-based, we can put that on a variables control chart. Um, if we can only count incidents or events, or if we express data in the form of proportions, percentages, or even simple counted numbers, any of those scenarios can be put onto a control chart. Um, so that gives um, non-manufacturing processes a very wide scope. Um, financial transactions, de debtor days, um, pro processing times, delivery times, um, it's really just limited to the, our imagination. Um, these days, the quality management standards like ISO 9001 require all processes to be monitored and measured. We don't always have data. Um, sometimes we have reviews, um, but very often there are data are collected, data is collected. And if we wanted to put that onto a control chart, um, we could do that um, with a view to improvement. We've um, we've used um, control charts in the medical industry uh, uh, for processes there. We've used we've used control charts in the software industry, for software development. Uh, we've used control charts in the uh, um, uh, call centres where uh, monitoring uh, uh, response time and relief time and those sorts of things. So it's a very common uh, usage in in all of all industries, service and uh, manufacturing. Um, the, yes, and the, the other thing to note these days is that because of computer technology, we do have probably more options than were available in Schuert's day. So, for example, um, yeah. if we have processes where rare events occur, we can now chart that typically using what's known as a G chart, which is based on a geometric um, distribution, or we might base we might put that data onto a T chart which is time-based, um, which is based on a viable distribution. Um, so we, we, we've got the option these days, by, by using Schuert's principles um, and using technology as well, um, we've got the option to apply the basic SPC principles in a much broader range of processes. So medical errors, medication errors, th data like that, um, which hopefully are very rare, um, can go onto a control chart. Yeah. So where where you can capture data, it can be it can be processed and and and, and used for uh, for control. I, we we we've spoken about data, we've spoken about technology, um, and you know technology facilitating and enabling um, SPC, um, making it perhaps easier than relying on uh, a pencil and a and a good mind for mathematics. Um, but you know, to take that uh, that technology scenario further, we're we're increasingly in a in an age of, of digital transformation. Um, technology is moving uh, at, at an incredible pace, um, and we're dealing increasingly um, not uh, you know with with bigger and bigger quantities of data um, from more and more uh, parts of a business and a process. Um, so in in a in an environment where SPC has been based on samples of data from perhaps a small um, a small pool, when we start thinking about um, concepts like big data, um, when you're when you're required to process massive quantities, um, how can how can we um, how can we adapt and apply SPC to uh, to processing such vast quantities of data? 
Well, Stuart's view would probably have been that we would that would not be an appropriate use for a control chart because there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the aim was to use very small samples of data. Stuart wanted to capture a, a snapshot at an instant in time of process performance and then see how it changed over time. So rather than, rather than seeking large quantities of data, Stuart's view was very much the opposite. Um, he wanted to work with as little data as possible. And within the context of SPC, that actually works very well. Um, there are other tools and techniques available these days which are more appropriate for handling large data sets. Um, so we might carry out data mining, we might use machine learning, where we, we, we use software to actually learn what is going on um, within a large data set, to recognise patterns that are going on within very large data sets. And that might be useful for predicting things like um, customer spending habits or customer preferences. Um, so it's used, um, that, that scenario is used often for predictive purposes. Um, but Stuart's methodology really was quite different from that. Um, and he wanted things to be simple. He wanted to empower people working in their process to understand their performance in real time and to be able to respond promptly to any change. He, he, he wanted to move away from the situation where um, data analysis was the province of the statistician or the data analyst or those that have the necessary software. Even though the process generates lots of data though, John, even though it, there's a lot of data there, as long as you can sequence it and sample it and take the sampling sequences of the right size, uh, of the right uh, size and those sorts of things, um, then that SPC would be applicable in with that data set where it's a, a process data set. Yes? Is that fair? Um, I'm not sure I fully understood. All I, was, all I meant was that if you've got a large body of data, as long as it's being yep. continually being generated in a process, you can change the sample size, change the frequency of sampling of that data, uh, and you'll still be able to produce a, 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 an SBC chart from it. And so it is applicable in that sense. If you want to monitor a process that's producing a lot of data, you can still use SBC charts in that context. I'll just add one more bit. Uh, let's look at the other extreme as well, because a lot of people say you can't apply SBC to, to small batch quantities, and yet we've got this uh, short run SBC methodology that we could bring to uh, apply as well. Sorry, two questions there. Sorry, John. Um, y y yes, um, this is another situation where SPC has expanded over the years. One, one of the most useful control charts is in fact the individual's control chart known as an XMR chart and this uses subgroups of samples of one, one observation because there are many processes where we can only sensibly obtain um, one observation at each sampling point. For example, if we wanted to monitor monthly sales, we can only have one monthly sales figure each month for a certain product. Um, and some organizations in manufacturing are very low volume and they may produce a batch of work once a month or once every couple of weeks. So we don't have large quantities of data. Um, the individual's chart can handle that in a very similar way to um, the charts that we've been discussing today. The methodology is the same. Um, also, we do have um, short run control charts available today. Um, and this is another uh, area where software can help because we, we can um, plot either short production runs onto a short run chart. Production runs are over very quickly. We're completed within a short amount of time. Um, or we can pr plot um, production runs um, where the process output um, is generated very slowly and we, we change from one product type to another um, in succession. So that, that type of data can go onto one chart um, and the benefits are that we maintain the running record without fragmenting um, the flow of information. Alex. Thank you very much.
Look, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, we're at three o'clock uh, GMT. Um, so just to say um, thanks again, John and Jeff, for, uh, for, for this excellent hour we've spent in your company. Uh, we really appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you everyone for, for attending um, and thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get through all of them, um, but we shall, we shall address um, further questions in writing um, and make it available uh, with the webinar recording. As I said at the head of the session, um, the recording of this webinar will be made available on the CQI website in the members area. So please do go and look at it and, and remember to update your continuing professional development log um, once you've reflected uh, on what you've learnt um, from today's session. Um, please do let us know your feedback. There is a link in the chat function uh, on GoToWebinar um, to a short, uh, a short survey just to ask for your feedback on this uh, and other CQI webinars. Your feedback is vitally important um, to us, um, so please take the time to do that. Um, coming up on the horizon tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m., we have a webinar with NQA um, looking at information management systems, um, particularly privacy information management systems, um, and ISO 27701, um, its importance uh, and relevance today that's with nqa and risk evolves so if you haven't signed up for that yet um, there are a few spaces left um, but be quick because there aren't many um, with no further ado i'd just like to say thanks again to john and jeff um, and to you all for coming and i'll look forward to seeing you all uh, at future cqi webinars thank you very much thank you You're welcome